So journalist and public intellectual Naomi Klein hardly needs an introduction. Her most recent book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate, was named one of New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2014 and has already been translated into 25 languages. 25 languages. I tried to count out 25 languages last night. That one piece of information alone indicates that her clear analysis, pointed critique, and her fighting determination to make, motivate all of us to engage resonates powerfully across the globe. Building on the themes that she laid out in her previous book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, in which she demonstrates over and over again how multinational corporation, corporate leaders invest instigate or create disasters to first destroy the public infrastructure that exists and replace it with an infrastructure that serves their interests. In her new book, she challenged us all, all of us, to engage, to do what we are called to do and do that fully. When Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf South, destroying New Orleans, revealing to the world the dilapidated state of our American infrastructure, particularly the infrastructure to help people living under poverty and people who have long been pushed out and held outside of the circle of human concern through multi-layered processes of racialization. This climate event was used as an excuse to absolutely decimate what little was left in the way of public infrastructure and racial anxiety was used to quell any resistance. In Louisiana, was put under the chokehold of an economy designed to serve a few at the expense of people and the environment. Tested and tried all over the world, neoliberalism had come home. And now the rampant spread of policies that advance human disregard and elimination of all vestiges of public policy that Angela spoke so nicely of as public expressions of love towards people and planet continues at a furious pace. And unfortunately, and with increasing disastrous consequences, too many of us are sitting by and watching as this continues, fearful of change, fearful of ex engaging with people who we perceive to be different from ourselves, fearful that we may need to change how we work, and fearful of fear. But Naomi has ideas, and her gift is her courage and tenacity in sharing them with us and inviting us to engage with each other in what necessarily will be the struggle for our lives, for our children's lives, and life on Earth. It is with great pleasure I welcome Naomi Klein, engaged global citizen. Thank you so much, Connie, for that amazing introduction. Um, like so many others, I, I feel so grateful uh, to John Powell uh, for all of his work, um, which has had a huge influence on me, um, was part of the journey that, that brought me to, to writing this book. Um, it, in many ways, this book grew out of research I was doing on reparations and a realization that uh, climate change could be the catalyst uh, for paying uh, some very, very old and also some very current debts. Um, and and John's research into how that could happen um, uh, really in informed my analysis, and I feel very grateful to him. I want to thank all the organizers uh, of this incredible event, all the other speakers. Um, like all of you, I have been fortified and challenged and inspired again and again over these past couple of days, and I have to admit that I do find it um, more than a little intimidating to have been given this space so near the end of our, of our time together. Um, and I'm going to try to honor uh, that by, by using this speech to bring together some of the themes, uh, not all of them, I won't be able to do that, but some of the thing, themes that have emerged so powerfully over these last few days. Um, so my talk, as you know, is about the role of othering in both creating and deepening the climate crisis. Now in his opening address, John Powell spoke about how if we think about neoliberalism as a car, 
a set of economic policies that serve to enrich elites and further stratify wealth, then anxiety of the other is the fuel that is powering that car, which I think is a really useful metaphor uh, for understanding the utility of racism, uh, the utility of othering more broadly. Um, and I certainly agree with that metaphor, but I want to build on it a little bit by saying it's more than a metaphor. Our literal cars and pretty much everything else in our economy runs on fossil fuels, which in turn is fueling the climate crisis. And the capacity to write off large segments of humanity as other, as disposable, as less than human and therefore worthy of sacrifice, has been utterly integral to the very fact of powering our economies with fossil fuels, and it always has been. Fossilized energy cannot exist, never has been able to exist, without sacrificial places and sacrificial people. Right? I mean, if we think about this, since the earliest days of the commercial steam engine, uh, that decision uh, to power the Industrial Revolution with coal, fossil fuels have been toxic to those on the front lines of their extraction and their refinement. At every stage in the life cycle, or death cycle, if you will, the true costs of deriving energy from long buried life forms are systematically externalized onto the other. Whether that other is in the biosphere or the other is other humans. The lungs of the earliest coal miners and to this day, um, coal mining is one of the riskiest professions. The lungs of children and elderly breathing the smog, whether in Dickensian London, um, or Richmond, California today, or Shanghai, China. The risks uh, of powering our economy with fossil fuels also get dumped onto our soil, our rivers, our oceans, and of course, our atmosphere. The term energy sacrifice zone was an acceptable part of policymaking in this country for decades. And um, what has been happening lately with tar sands pipelines and oil trains and natural gas fracking is that the sacrifice zones, the zone of sacrifice has been growing as we enter into this stage of extreme energy now that the easy to access stuff is largely tapped out. And it's reaching into all kinds of places that imagined themselves safe, that were living with this unspoken bargain of we get the power and others get the sacrifice. Um, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that, um, reports that more than 15 million Americans live within a mile of a well that has been drilled and fracked since the year 2000. That's how quickly this is spreading. And now with climate change, some of the wealthiest coastal cities and uh, most desirable vacation zones find themselves in the sacrifice zone. So in a way, this spreading of the sacrifice zone uh, is a microcosm of how our economy as a whole, which has been waging war on social protections, on the very notion of the public good, on the collective, has been systematically lowering labor standards, hollowing out communities, deepening inequalities, and now with climate change uh, is threatening the life support systems of the planet itself. So the ante is being and everything is on the line now. So some environmentalists use the existential nature of the climate crisis to say this is so big, it threatens everything and everyone, so it should trump everything. We should solve this and, um, and, and then we can worry about the rest of it. Uh, so what does racism and inequality matter when life itself is under threat? The argument that I'm making and so many others in the climate justice movement and environmental movement have been making for so long is the exact opposite. That only when we confront these overlapping crises in a truly holistic way, see how they intersect, will we have a chance of winning on any front. 
Because the thing about climate change is though it is ultimately an existential threat for all of humanity, it does discriminate. And it hits the poor first and worst, which means that this powerful capacity to write off the other that is at the heart of our current system um, is shaping the way we respond to climate change and has been from day one. Um, and you know, that means Everything from the fact that, you know, if we truly believed that every life counted on this planet, we would already be treating climate change as a five alarm fire. So that sort of subconscious writing off and hierarchy of life plays out in the way we negotiate with the numbers. Well, we'll wait, we'll wait till 2020 or 2020. We're going to take this seriously, just not yet, right? So we are making those calculations, and our policymakers, more importantly, are making those calculations. It informs it on every level, whether, whether we decide to ignore climate change, whether we decide to bargain with it. You know, we'll let the oceans r r rise by this much, but no more. Um, or by imagining that we can fix the problem with big technology, regardless of the new sacrifice zones that that creates, whether it's nuclear or whether it is geoengineering. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that later on. So unless we confront the core logic of othering, we will never rise to the challenge of climate change. Indeed, I would argue that it is what has been blocking us all along. The good news is that preventing catastrophic warming is still within our power to do. We can cut our emissions deeply enough to prevent truly catastrophic warming. The catch is that those kinds of cuts, and what, you know, what leading emission experts tell us now is that if we want to do this, we need to be cutting our emissions by around 8 to 10 percent a year. That's because we've put it off for so long that if we now want to stay within our global carbon budget, we now need to be cutting so radically that, and this is the argument I make in the book, that it clashes directly with the guiding logic of a capitalist economy, which is the pursuit of short-term growth at all costs. There isn't an economist in the world who can tell you how you reconcile 8 to 10 percent emission reduction cuts with a growth-based economy. Now, as I'm going to return to, we can grow parts of our economy as we contract the parts of our economy that um, are destabilizing life. But this transition requires such profound investments in the public sphere, such courageous regulations of polluters, and such visionary allocation of resources that it flies in the face of the ideology that has all of our elites in its grips. So that's why I call the book This Changes Everything. I'm not saying the book changes everything. I'm saying climate change changes everything. Because if we stay on the road we're on that is politely called business as usual, we are headed towards a level of warming that changes everything about our physical world. We can get off that road, but it now requires such a sharp turn, such a sharp veer that we can't do it without changing everything about our political and economic system. Now, if everything was OK about that political and economic system, except for climate change, we would truly be screwed, right? Because people are not going to mobilize around that if everything's fine. But the good news is that that economic system is screwing the vast majority of people on this planet with or without climate change. So we have a lot of people who are potentially highly motivated to grab that wheel and swerve if we can really map out a justice-based agenda. So. This shift that, that I'm talking about is political, it is economic, it's also ideological. We can't be afraid of talking about the ideology that got us into this and the ideology that can get us out of it. It's also imaginative, which is why it's so wonderful that there's been so much art integrated to our discussion here, because this is not going to be uh, done by boring nonfiction writers alone. Um, and it's also profoundly spiritual. And I'm going to going to talk a little bit more about that uh, a little later on. It is. Um, and this is why I feel really grateful to the people who framed this conference, to John and others, is that 
it really is a fundamental shift from a society based on othering to one grounded in that unequivocal and unshakable commitment to belonging. And I'm gonna just um, show a, a really short clip of a video um, that is from a documentary film. It's a work in progress that uh, my partner Avi Lewis is directing right now. It's just a three and a half minute clip. Um, and this particular scene was, uh, it's part of a longer sequence that was filmed in Northern Alberta in a region that contains the largest known uh, oil deposit on the planet. Um, that's not in Saudi Arabia. It is in the Alberta tar sands. Uh, and that's that extra dirty oil, three times more carbon intensive than a traditional barrel of conventional crude, um, that if it weren't for an incredible grassroots movement would now be being piped through the Keystone XL pipeline to the Gulf Coast. And that movement has succeeded in blocking the northern uh, part of that pipeline for many years now. Um, so, um, the movement against the Keystone XL did not begin with ranchers in Nebraska, although they have been amazing, or environmentalists uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it began with uh, indigenous people living downstream uh, in Alberta. Um, uh, they were dealing with the direct health impacts of, uh, of living downstream from the largest industrial project on earth, dealing with it through cancer cu clusters. Um, the wildlife they depend on has become sick. Much of it has disappeared. So um, will you please play this clip? Well, the one thing I would, I would, the other thing I would just add to make clear is that we're gonna meet a tar sands worker and then we're gonna meet a young Cree woman named um, Crystal Lehman. And in this clip, she's just found out that there's an oil spill going on on her territory, um, the ter traditional territory uh, um, of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. And this has turned out to be the largest uh, oil spill in the history of the tar sands. Uh, and um, the part that's a little unclear is that the spill is taking place on a mine site that is within a military testing zone where the Canadian government tests live missiles. So it's a place where they drill for oil and bomb it. Um, what could possibly go wrong? Let's roll that clip. It's, it's very hard to watch. And actually, that last clip, we, we didn't put in the last cut of the film because it was just so so horrifying, you know? Um, and um, we're still debating whether or not to put it in the film, but I wanted to show it to you um, because I think this whole sequence really highlights the habits of mind that serve to justify enormously destructive environmental practices that are at the heart of so many of the crises we face. So we hear for starters, that this incredibly beautiful and carbon sequestering boreal forest was a wasteland before the oil industry arrived, which of course is one of the codes for nothing there, right? Terra nullius, um, you know, nothing but useless trees, right? Um, and that is what justifies the sacrifice, right? And the use of the word wasteland is particularly interesting because this worker works within an industry that is turning this part of the world into a literal wasteland, right? That the tailing ponds and the tar sands can be seen from space. And, but, but he needs to cling to this story, this wasteland story, because that's what justifies it, right? It was already wasted. Um, and, you also hear one of the ugliest words in the English language, uh, which is overburden. <laughs> overburden is this, is this term that the mining industry uses to describe everything that gets in the way in between their bulldozers, or whatever the machinery is, and the prize. In this case, bitumen. It could be gold. It could be copper. It could be coal, right? It's, it's, it's trees. It's soil. It's rocks. It is the life that gets in the way of money. And I would argue, though it is unspoken, that people are also overburdened when they get in the way of money uh, on those territories. And it so happens that the largest pools of carbon uh, on the planet are 
underneath indigenous lands, whether it's in the Alberta tar sands, whether it's in the Amazon, whether it's the Niger Delta. Um, and that is very inconvenient, especially when indigenous people, in, as they do in Canada, have constitutionally protected rights and are, in, in the case of the Beaver Lake Cree for First Nation, suing the Canadian government for 15,000 violations of their treaty um, because of uh, the Alberta tar sands. And this is affecting investor confidence. So overburden. Um, and in the, that clip, we see how uh, quickly this idea of no one being there, nothing being there, turns against the people who are there, right? And we see it in that sort of everyday racism exchange that Crystal experienced uh, when she was talking uh, to that official, as she described it, who treated her like some dumb Indian. This is one of the most important environmental activists in the world today. She was at the very front of the march of 400,000 people in New York City in September. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then we also see this really heavy duty version of it. If the conquistadors had come, we wouldn't have a problem, right? And how quickly it gets there. Um, and that's taking place in a context in which the Canadian government is passing laws that make it a lot easier to prosecute indigenous people as terrorists if they stand in the way of infrastructure that is seen as being critical to national security, which includes oil pipelines and so on. Um, and it takes place in a global context where there is a marked increase in attacks on land defenders around the world, uh, a dramatic increase in murders of indigenous people who are engaged in land defense, um, uh, particularly in Latin America. Um, so I think this reminds us, though, though we have been talking about neoliberalism, we really are talking about a much longer story and a story that is not in the past, that this is colonialism in action and this is yesterday, right? Um, so I also think it's really critical that we emphasize systems because increasingly we hear our era defined as something called the Anthropocene. How many people have heard the Anthropocene phrase? Yeah, I mean, it, in climate circles, it's really, really trendy. And it's this idea that we have exited the Holocene and we have now entered a new age, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. And it's marked by the fact that our activities, in particular the changing of the climate, um, are so significant that it signifies a new geologic epoch. Um, and, you know, um, in, it's in this context that uh, we hear climate change blamed very often on human nature, okay? Uh, this supposedly innate greed and short-sightedness that is the hallmark of our species. And you often hear this story that as soon as humans discovered fire, um, it became inevitable that humans would dig up pools of carbon, light them on fire, and, um, and, and warm the earth. So it's sort of like, the problem is we're too clever. That's the story that's told. It's sort of our tragic flaw is just how smart we are, right? Um, we are the fire apes, um, according to this story. And um, there are different lessons being taken from this human nature argument, depending on your perspective. You've got one camp that has concluded that humans are a disease and we should engage in population control or just be glad that the earth is going to shake us off and enjoy the scenery on the way down. Um, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, it's really just palliative care we should be talking about now. It's an incredibly privileged position. Um, it is its own process of othering because it's basically writing off billions of people and it comes from a position of thinking, well, I'm going to be okay watching this burn. Now, some claim that if cleverness got us into this mess, then cleverness can get us out. And this is a more uh, powerful narrative, particularly in the United States. Um, so we just have to live up to our destiny as uh, what the British writer Mark Linus calls the God species, right? Once we discovered fire, we became as gods and we can patch together some pastiche of techno fixes from next generation nuclear to drought resistant GMO seeds to synthetic biology and geoengineering, hacking the planet, turning down the sun by spraying sulfur in the stratosphere, fertilizing the oceans. I wish I was kidding. I spend, have spent a long 
time with, um, with the would-be geoengineers. Um, and there are big sacrifice zones built into these giddy dreams. So it's taken for granted within both these narratives um, that, uh, that, human, that the, the human species it can't change because this is innate. This problem that we have of short-sightedness and greed is innate. And that's why we either have to be written off um, or we need some huge technological fix. Um, we certainly can't fix ourselves. So, I don't think that humans are a curse on the planet, and I also don't think that we are gods that are going to save it. I think we are part of the planet. Um, but I think that what is appealing about both these narratives, and even though these two camps often fight amongst themselves, I think they're flip sides of the same story, right? Because they both put us at the center of the story, whether as villains or heroes, right? It still all revolves around us. But most importantly, what this discourse masks is the fact that the decision to power our economies with coal and then oil and gas was not a decision that was made by humans as a whole. It was not a decision that was made by our species en masse. Rather, it was a decision made by a very small minority of humans um, in a very specific place. That place was England, um, working within a very new kind of economy this is int intimately connected uh, to the birth of modern capitalism. The commercial steam engine um, hit the market the same year that Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations. That is not a coincidence. Um, and um, it is true uh, in the, that in the 1700s, when the first commercial steam engine was introduced, um, when fossil fuel companies buy off, at, at, at this point, you, know, the, you had the same clash between renewable energy uh, that we have today and, uh, and, and the fossil fuel industry. So this collective blame um, also masks the fact that a great many humans, despite knowing that carbon was underground on their territory, chose not to burn it. And this includes the Korean Northern Alberta. In fact, all the indigenous people in Northern Alberta knew that that tarry oil, that it's called bitumen, was there. They used it to, to, um, to waterproof their canoes. They knew this well before settlers arrived. They just decided not to burn it for some reason. Does that make them un inhuman? Um, their human nature told them not to do it. Most critically, the notion that humans are collectively responsible for fouling the planet masks the fact that at every stage in the evolution of the fossil fuel-based economy, there have been humans who resisted it, right? Workers who took on the coal barons and then the oil barons for poisoning their bodies, other workers who resisted their replacement by coal-powered machines, communities that resisted the mining and drilling of their lands, um, and this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, these have been some of the most epic battles in social movement history. So if humans aren't responsible, what is? Now, I, I find it useful to go back to the early days, and especially, you know, I don't usually go, go into this part of the research, but because so much of our discussion over the past few days have been, has been about connection and disconnection, um, I wanted to share with you that one of the things I found most interesting when I was doing the research for, for, this, for this latest book was going back and reading the marketing material for the first commercial steam engines. Um, because it was actually a hard sell. This is one of the things that, that people don't realize. They, people think like, oh, they invented the steam engine, and then immediately people dropped renewable energy and went for coal. But that wasn't true. You know, at that time, ships were powered with sails, and factories were, were powered by water wheels. And people liked that because both of those commodities were free the mechanisms were more reliable than the early steam engines, which were breaking down all the time. So it was a tough sell. And um, for the ownership class that was at this time amassing unimaginable new wealth as a result of slave labor, slave labor and early industrialization, there were some downsides to relying on renewable energy. Uh, if the winds were low, the ships didn't sail. That slowed production. 
If water levels in rivers uh, were low, it also meant that you had to suspend work in factories. But there was something else, which is that factories had to be built where the water was rushing, where there were rapids, where there were waterfalls. And so that meant that factories were generally in rural places on the countryside. So as workers began to unionize, this became a problem because workers had a lot of power. If you have a factory in an isolated location, you don't have a lot of surplus labor and your workers can negotiate pretty well. So the, 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 the selling point that ultimately convinced, after several decades, um, uh, uh, that, that ma convinced manufacturers to adopt the commercial steam engine was that this would allow mobility and more control over their workers. It meant you don't have to build your factory next to a waterfall. You can build it in an urban center where there's surplus labor. When your workers go on strike, replace them with other workers. So um, it was two things. It was control over nature. You can sail your boats whenever you decide. Um, and you can build your factories wherever you want. But it was power in the service of dominance over other people those people being slaves, those people being workers. Um, and, the, and, you know, what's, I said it's so striking, you know, reading the, the, the marketing material, I'll read you a, a, a brochure from 1830 about the steam engine. It says, its mighty services are always at our command, whether in winter or in summer, by day or night. It knows no intermission but what our wishes dictate. So this was the promise of coal from the beginning. You're the boss. You're in charge. You now don't have to think about these annoying issues like wind and water. Um, everywhere is everywhere else. And you can have this one-way, non-reciprocal relationship with both the natural world and other human beings. So this, the, the, the methods of extraction, both extracting from nature and extracting labor from people, um, went hand in hand from the very beginning. And it continues to this day, right? It's fossil fuels powering our ships, our planes, that allow factory owners to shut down their factories um, in the United States and then Mexico, move them to China where labor is cheaper um, and energy is dirtier. Um, and this is why there has been an emission explosion uh, in, since starting in 2000 when the globalization process accelerated uh, so much. And, and uh, one of the people who I, I rely on for this research is a Swedish historian uh, named Andreas Malm who calls climate change the atmospheric legacy of class warfare. Um, so the logic of domination and the easy acceptance of sacrificial people in places has always been at the center of the fossil fuel-based economy. This is more than a metaphor. Othering created the crisis, and it also colors quite literally how our societies are failing to respond uh, to climate change. Now, this is important to understand in the context of the denial industry, um, where you see it most clearly. And I could go on about this for a long time, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about right-wing climate deniers, because I actually don't even really think they're our biggest problem. Um, but we know that you know, the US uh, the, ha the has, has the highest rates of climate denial uh, anywhere in the world. Um, but, but denial of climate change is, is incredibly unevenly distributed, right? So around 71% of Democrats uh, believe that climate change is happening and that humans are causing it. This has remained relatively stable, gone up a little bit since 2000. Um, on the right, there has been this precipitous collapse in belief in, in climate change. And the further right you go, when you get to the Tea Party, for instance, um, you know, you have, you know, parts of the US where just 20% of self-identified Republicans believe in climate change. Um, and we know that now, you know, if you want to be the leader of the Republican Party, you have to say you don't believe in climate change and that you were wrong when you said you did a few years ago, right? Um, so, you know, the, the argument I make in the book is that the reason for this is because 
I actually think the right understands climate change better than a lot of liberals. Um, and I, you know, also in addition to spending time with would-be geoengineers, I've spent a fair bit of time with climate change deniers at the Heartland Institute. Um, and they're very frank about the fact that if climate change is real, it's the end of their ideological project. They understand that. If climate change is real, then it means huge investments in the public sphere. It means an end to austerity. Um, and uh, they can't accept that. So they're questioning the science. Um, but I think it goes deeper than that. Uh, as we heard from John Powell and Manuel Pasteur yesterday, the steady attacks on public services, education, welfare, transit, are closely linked to that anxiety about the other, about race. Um, and the, those who are getting the benefits. That's why we saw that huge gap um, uh, uh, in, in, you know, in the places where you have the biggest gap, generational gap uh, around race, you also have the biggest cuts to social spending. And I think you see this really clearly in California, you know, scratch the surface around you know, why there's such unwillingness to invest in the public sphere. It's because those other people are the ones who are gonna be benefiting from it. What I have found in my time spent with climate change deniers is that the thing that bothers them most about climate change is that they see it as a backdoor means to redistribute wealth to brown people in the United States and to brown people in other countries. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes this is, is discussed very explicitly, you know, where climate negotiations are uh, talked about as extortion of the United States uh, by the global south um, and so on. But it is true uh, that, um, that if we take climate change seriously, we do need to invest in parts of the public sphere that do benefit uh, low-income people the most. And as we know in the United States, there's a close, close correlation between income levels um, and race. So they're not crazy. They understand something. And uh, they're wrong about the science, uh, but they're right in many ways about the political implications of the science. Climate change lights up all of these anxieties, but it also, it challenges this dominance-based worldview uh, fundamentally, and, and I'll come back to that. Um, but it also challenges American exceptionalism in a way that is particularly hard for the right. Uh, because, of course, we know that we can't do this alone. America cannot do this alone. Um, it can help, it can lead, uh, but this is by its very nature a collective pr crisis that requires unprecedented levels of cooperation, and yes, transfers of wealth and resources. This is the issue that breaks down every single climate negotiation, is that the Global South comes together as a block and says, hey, guys, you have a 200-year head start on emitting uh, carbon, and our solutions have to reflect that. And there's a complete unwillingness to look at climate change through a historical lens. American negotiator after American ne negotiator says, we, the, you know, the thing we always hear from U.S. diplomats, um, we don't like to look backwards, right? We were all born yesterday. Um, let's just start this over reboot, um, and that doesn't work in climate negotiations, and that's really been the biggest issue. So there is going to have to be redistribution of wealth, of technology. It doesn't mean that you know, China and India don't do anything, but it means that we're not going to be able to escape from history. Um, but there's more to it, um, and you know, and this is one of the things I found most striking when I when I went to the Heartland Conference, which is the annual conference of climate change deniers that is hosted by this right wing think tank, the Heartland Institute. Um, it's just the sort of casualness with which the crisis was sort of joked about all the time. You know, like, hey, I moved to Houston because I like the heat, um, and uh, the the um, there was. One speaker named Patrick Michaels, uh, who works at the, at the Cato Institute, um, who gave this speech where he said, he, he was talking about this heat wave that had hit Europe and it had killed 15,000 people in France. And he said, well, you know what happened after that? The French discovered Walmart and bought air conditioners. Um, and it was so, um, you know, obvious that he knows that not everybody in the world can just go buy an air conditioner at Walmart. So implicit in this, de de in this denial 
um, was this othering, this willingness to write off huge segments of the world, um, and a worldview that provides the intellectual tools that somehow says, well, they deserve it. Um, another piece of this is that a lot of people who are denying climate change do believe that they will be safe in the same way that you have these dynamics in California where the people who don't want their tax dollars to go to public education are sending their kids to private schools, um, you know, drive cars, don't use public transit. Um, so you have this divide between who is using the public sphere, right? Um, so we increasingly are seeing privatized responses to disasters. So there is underlying the climate denial industry is, well, if we're wrong, we are gonna be all right. That may or may not turn out to be true, but that belief is clearly there, and we see it as well in um, the way in which you know, luxury uh, apartments in New York post Sandy are marketing the fact that they have uh, you know, gold-plated private disaster infrastructure, everything from emergency lighting and water pumps and generators to 13-foot floodgates and watertight rooms sealed with submarine-style doors in the case of one new <laughs> Manhattan condominium. According to one developer, buyers would happily pay to be relatively reassured they wouldn't be terribly inconvenienced in case of a natural disaster. And when I wrote The Shock Doctrine, I, I wrote about a Florida-based uh, um, airline. I, I ended up being short-lived, but I'm sure we'll see some version of it again. This was um, an airline called Help Jet, whose slogan was, turn your disaster into a luxury vacation. And you would join Help Jet as a member. They would alert you when a hurricane was coming to your area, um, send a car to pick you up, take you to the private jet, and book your vacation for you. Um, no inconvenience at all. We are also seeing in California and Colorado, private firefighting um, uh, where, you know, if you pay extra for your gold-plated insurance, your house will be hosed down in, um, in, in uh, flame retardant. This is a quote-unquote concierge service pioneered by AIG. Um, so where does this all lead? We know. It leads to New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. We saw what this looked like, right? If you had money, um, and in New Orleans, that mainly meant if you were white, you got into your car, you drove out of town, you called your, you checked into a hotel, you called into, you called your insurance company. It wasn't fun, um, but it was certainly survivable. If you depended on the state at any level, you were absolutely abandoned. You were abandoned on rooftops, uh, holding signs that said help abandoned in the Superdome uh, for days without food and water. Um, and, uh, and we saw the instant labeling of the African-American population of New Orleans as looters, animals, and then refugees. Right? Refugees, when they were forcibly evacuated, given one-way tickets, and spread throughout the United States. If this is how a culture based on dominance and othering treats its own citizens as the temperatures rise, what can we expect from actual climate refugees under that same system? We know the answer to that because it's happening already. Um, and uh, you know, just one example, this is not just an American phenomenon, there was this terrible flooding in the UK a couple winters ago, and it took place in the context of a Tory government, the, the Cameron government, that had, uh, in the name of austerity, cut everything, including flood defenses. Um, uh, and uh, it had laid off more than 1,000 workers whose job it was to prepare the country uh, for floods, and it turned out that some Tory ridings uh, were flooded, some very wealthy areas. Now, the Daily Mail, which is like the new, kind of like the New York Post, um, didn't like this at all. But what was their response? Well, they realized, okay, we do need the state in a disaster, so we have to rethink that. They launched a petition off the cover of the paper, of their tabloid, calling on the British government to divert $11 billion in foreign aid to 
flood defense and home, right? This in the country that invented the commercial steam engine and is arguably you know, more responsible for climate change and its impacts in places like Bangladesh than anyone else. But when they were hit within this mindset, it was batten down the hatches, look after your own, screw everybody else. So unless we radically change our values, and you know, we've heard a lot of talk about values, um, these are the values that will rule our stormy future even more than they rule our stormy present. So, um, you know, I said I didn't want to talk too much about climate change deniers because this isn't just about uh, that kind of denial. It's, it's about all of us. It's about the way in which, uh, you know, the Obama government went to Copenhagen and worked with other governments to set a temperature target. We will allow warming to increase by no more than two degrees Celsius. Um, now, we haven't even allowed warming to increase by one degree, and you guys are already feeling the effects here in California. Um, so when that happened, when, when this document was leaked, this was in Copenhagen in 2009, when the two degree temperature target was set, and it was a backroom deal of, of the, the biggest economies that was done without consultation from some of the poorest and most impacted economies. Um, you know, it was this incredibly powerful and painful moment at the summit. Up to this point, you know, these summits are really boring and bureaucratic and everybody's talking in acronyms. But when this document leaked that set the target, that defined dangerous as two degrees, um, the African delegates at, uh, in Copenhagen walked out of their sessions en masse and marched through the hallways of this cavernous convention center chanting, we will not die quietly. Two degrees is suicide. And they said the paltry sums that rich countries had pledged for financing was not enough to buy us coffins to bury us in. Um, so, you know, the phrase had not been coined yet, but they were clearly saying that Black Lives Matter and a two degree temperature target was writing off millions of those lives. Um, island nations were chanting 1.5 to survive. Um, so this same willingness to write off huge segments of humanity is going to continue to govern our response to climate change if we don't get off this course. And it's not only about letting the temperatures rise, turning away uh, climate migrants, but I mentioned before geoengineering. And um, you know, the scariest part about geoengineering, this uh, idea that, it, that is getting more and more traction, that we, can that we can lower temperatures forcibly by imitating a volcano. I don't know if you've heard about this idea, the Pinatubo effect. I know that this sounds like very out there in sci-fi, but believe me when I tell you that our elites are taking it more seriously than putting up solar panels on a massive scale, because that's considered unrealistic. Um, and this, however, is what serious people think is realistic, uh, turning down the sun. Now, when you do this, according to the, when you put sulfur in the stratosphere to tr solve the problem of you know, carbon in the atmosphere, um, you, uh, what, we, what, what the climate models show, but also what history tells us, because the, this is an attempt to imitate very powerful volcanoes, and we can look um, at what has happened in the aftermath of those very powerful volcanoes that have put sulfur into the stratosphere um, and have indeed lowered temperatures for a couple of years. That happened after Mount Pinatubo. It's happened several times, and it's measurable. But it has also interfered with the summer monsoons in India um, and in Africa. So this same mentality, this same sacrifice zone mentality, could very easily lead our leaders to calling uh, a solution, an action which could interfere with the food and water systems of billions of people on the planet, some of the poorest people on the planet that did the least to create this crisis. That is why it is so urgent to confront this logic, among other reasons. And you know, I often think that the biggest problem we have is that this doesn't surprise us. In fact, this is like a cliche what I'm describing. You know, when I describe health, help jet or, you know, AIG, it's like any, any action movie set in the future, this is the future 
it shows, right? You think about um, Hunger Games, you know, the, the, the capital um, with, you know, the 1% the, the, the of the 1% that has everything and then, you know, the masses locked out and surveilled and militarized. Um, or Elysium, um, you know, where, where the 1% of the 1% lived in that, um, uh, that, that, that sort of planet spaceship hovering over the Earth and, and you know, Matt Damon led an uprising and then, um, you know, or, or Snowpiercer, which the, the version they were all on a train and the 1% of the 1% are at the front of the train or, you know, Children of Men. I mean, we just keep telling the story. It's the story of the rapture. It's the story of Noah's Ark. It's the oldest story in the book, you know. It is, you know, that th this, this small group of winners will be saved and the rest will be screwed. So, I mean, I think part of what we have to confront is that it's almost like we're bored about the end of the world, you know? And I, there's this whole genre of this being called cli-fi, you know, science fiction about climate change, where it's almost like we think, well, we'll shock people into action if we, if we show them this really scary future of what it's gonna look like. But we already know it. It looks like, it looks like New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. We've seen it. And the real problem is that we can't imagine another future. <laughs> That's the problem. We don't need to keep imagining that same future over and over again. We need to imagine something better. Um, so what would it look like um, if the world was governed by belonging instead of othering? Put another way, how can the existential urgency of the climate crisis kick our butts out of our respective silos and build a coherent progressive movement capable of winning? Um, somebody mentioned earlier, like, do we include the, Co the, the Koch brothers in our circle of belonging? I actually, I'd like to, I'd like to say, say that I feel grateful to the Koch brothers, and I'll tell you why. Um, they, I don't know if you've heard this, but they've decided to be more transparent um, about their about their funding, um, and um, and as part of this, they there was an announcement a couple of months ago where where uh, Charles Koch, a, a bit of a speech he gave, um, uh, became public where he announced that the Koch brothers would be marshalling $800 million in the next presidential cycle, right? Remember when we used to be shocked when an entire election cost that much money? That was 2008 when that shocked us. Now a single donor is coming forward and saying they're going to spend that much money. Um, but what was interesting and why I'm grateful is because when he made this announcement, Charles Koch said that this money would go towards holding back the march of collectivism. So I thought it was interesting that they were being so transparent because I didn't realize that that was how they defined their meta-narrative, right? Because we know the Koch brothers fund all kinds of things, right? They you know, try to block climate action. Obviously, they're an oil conglomerate. Um, you know, and they fight gay marriage and they... Um, and, and they, they fund ALEC, and they fight Obamacare, and, but, and they you know, fight uh, 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 trade unions, and, 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 but, but they have a, a single story that unites it all, right? And their single story is they stand for individualism against the march of collectivism. And the reason why I think this is useful is because I think one of the problems we have is we don't have a meta narrative. <laughs> um, we have lots of issues and we have lots of campaigns. Um, but I think one of the legacies, frankly, of McCarthyism, blacklisting, COINTELPRO, decades of red baiting, is that we're actually afraid to have our own project, to have our own big ideas. So, uh, and, you know, funders were asking, how can we, that, that was one of the questions that came up, how, what can philanthropists do? Stop funding people to stay in silos. <laughs> um, because the right funds big ideas. But I would argue that liberal funders are afraid of the big ideas that truly animate the people who they fund. And we need to start talking about that. So. Um, all right, so what would a justice-based response to climate change look like? Um, uh, well, it would start with the science. 
It would start with what we're being told we need to do, which is cut our emissions by 8 to 10 percent a year. We're being told we need to leave around two-thirds of the, of the known carbon reserves in the ground. This is the framework in which we need to work in. These aren't the policies, right? This doesn't tell us how we need to do it, but the policies have to fit within that, okay? If, if, if we believe that, that all lives matter, and particularly black lives, then we have to cut our emissions very, very rapidly, and we have to do absolutely everything we can to stay well below a two-degree temperature target. Um, that's, that's where we start. So how do we do that? We also know that we can get to 100% renewables by 2030 or 2040. We know that now from research being done at Stanford University, it's possible to do, right? So this is the kind of framework in which we can work with. But I want to quote um, Mia uh, Yoshitani, who's the executive director of uh, the Oakland-based Asia-Pacific Environmental Network, APEN, because she says it so well. And people often remark that, 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 um, that Mia has the best quote in the book, so I'm just going to read it to you. The climate justice fight here in the U.S. and around the world is not just a fight against the biggest ecological crisis of our time. It is the fight for a new economy, a new energy system, a new democracy, a new relationship to the planet and to each other for land, water, and food sovereignty, for indigenous rights, for human rights, and dignity for all people. When climate justice wins, we win the world we want. We can't sit this one out, not because we have too much to lose, but we have too much to gain. We are, we are bound together in this battle, not just for a reduction in parts per million of CO2, but to transform our economies and rebuild a world that we want today. This is what a lot of commentators get wrong when they assume that climate action is futile because it asks us to sacrifice in the name of some far off benefit. Um, in the book, I quote uh, a British commentator who says, how can you persuade the human race, the human race again, to put the future ahead of the present? And the answer to that question is you don't. You point out that for a great many people, climate action is their best hope for a better present and a future far more exciting than anything else currently on offer, which is why climate justice activists here in the Bay Area have been demanding affordable housing close to mass tra transit stations to make sure that gentrification doesn't displace more of the people who actually use subways and buses. Um, and helping to create solar co-ops uh, in, in, in Richmond so that there are jobs on offer other than the ones at the Chevron refinery, which is a great example of you know, what we mean by a just transition. And that needs to extend to the workers who are going to be losing their jobs uh, in the fossil fuel sector as we stay within our carbon budget. Those workers need to be retrained to be getting the many, many more jobs that will be created if we decide to fit within our carbon budget and lower our emissions. Because that requires huge investments in transforming our energy grid, our transit system, um, and obviously in efficiency and so on. Um, I think, um, you know, in, if we look to Germany, as it's, you know, they have created 400,000 jobs just in the past decade as part of their energy transition. Another thing that, that Germany shows is that if you want to move quickly, big isn't better. Germany has created a system where they have a bold national feed-in tariff plan that uh, policy that encourages a lot of small responses, including 900 new energy cooperatives. We've also seen a reversal of privatization of the energy grids in hundreds of cities and towns because the private energy providers weren't getting with the program fast enough and people wanted to get to renewable energy. The, the private uh, utilities were standing in the way, so people voted to take back control over their energy grids in big cities like Hamburg, in small towns. Um, and this is a, a, you know, a real win-win because people uh, are switching to renewable energy, but they are also deepening their democracy and they're keeping resources in their communities in order, in order to pay for services. So this is another example of a just transition. Another one is that transit needs to be free, right? Transit needs to be accessible to all. Um, 
We also have to make sure that these jobs pay a living wage. The fight for 15 is part of the climate movement. So much of what is already happening is part of the climate movement. Um, and I think we need to redefine what a green job is. You know, I've been talking about green jobs in transit and efficiency and, and you know, putting up solar panels. But you know, we have low carbon workers already in our economy who are being systematically neglected and cut back, right? Care workers are already working in the low carbon economy. Um, you know, these, the, the, the workers in our economy who take care of our loved ones, take care of our homes, are the people who are using public transit and as part of their jobs are burning very, very little carbon. Same is true for educators, same is true for artists. And we live, you know, to quote the late great Eduardo Galliano, in a world upside down because if we lived in a world that was right side up, we would be investing in those parts of our economy that that are already low carbon and instead we're systematically slashing them. So obviously a response to climate change is completely incompatible with the logic of austerity. So there are all kinds of ways that climate change uh, calls on us to transform the status quo. I mean, where are we gonna get the money? We need a polluter pays framework, and that doesn't just mean a levy on extraction, a genuinely progressive carbon tax. It also means moving resources away from the military and uh, and using it to, to to pay for this transition. And all of this brings up the uh, the burning question of campaign finance reform, um, getting money out of politics, corporate personhood. Um, the complete failure of our media uh, to treat this issue as the crisis that it is. So, you know, this is also why I said this changes everything, because once you start connecting the dots, you can't stop. So we can either be overwhelmed by this, or we can be inspired by it. Um, because climate change builds our coalitions for us if we let it. This is the biggest tent of all. It's called the Earth's atmosphere. We're already under it. Um, we just have to start acting like it. A core principle of this movement has to be no more sacrifice zones. We can power our lives without poisoning anyone. The idea of the sacrifice zone belongs in the dustbin of history next to manifest destiny. And this idea uh, that, that we don't need sacrifice zones is at the center of this new and exciting climate activism that, uh, that fed that incredible march in New York City in September, the anti-fracking movement, the anti-pipeline movement, um, the, the, the movement against mountaintop coal removal, the movement that has been blocking coal export terminals up and down the Pacific Northwest. Um, the, this is, you know, it's often called the, you know, an anti-fossil fuel movement, but in fact it is a pro-water movement. It is animated uh, by the duty to protect water and by a fierce and ferocious love of place. And this love of place uh, has often been uh, uh, dismissed as nimbyism, not in my backyard. Um, but the French anti-fracking movement have this slogan, which is ni ici, ni ailleurs, not here, nor anywhere. No more sacrifice zones. And that is uh, a principle that I think we need to really understand um, because sac the, once you start sacrificing people in places, you kind of can't stop. And that's sort of where we are now with sacrifice zones. It's like that an oil spill that just keeps seeping further and further and the sacrifice zone is just getting bigger and bigger. Um, after two centuries of pretending that we could quarantine the collateral damage of this filthy habit, fobbing the risks off onto others, the game is up and we're all in the sacrifice zone now. Beijing's smog is California's drought. In short, we are all in this together. There is no other. If one group is sacrificed, we all eventually are as well. None of this means that environmental impacts are suddenly evenly distributed. To quote the civil rights lawyer, Dion Ferris, we're all in the same sinking boat. Only people of color are closer to the whole. So I wanna come back in, in conclusion to that original sales pitch for the steam engine that told industrialists in the 1700s that they were the boss, that if they bought this engine um, and used it in their factories and used it on their ships,
they would finally be able to dominate nature and have that one-way, non-reciprocal relationship that would enable dominance-based relationships with slaves, with workers, um, with other cultures whose resources they could extract. So climate change is saying, actually, no. All this time that we have been, we collectively have been burning carbon, it has been accumulating in the atmosphere, and now comes the response. And the response takes the form of hugely powerful storms and droughts um, and all kinds of disasters. And it comes at a couple hundred years delay, but it is impossible to ignore. This is the cumulative reaction to digging, all that digging and burning and taking and dominating and pretending that there would be no consequences, no blowback. The blowback is here. And it is our home saying to us, you thought you were in charge? You're just a guest here. You can get evicted for bad behavior. That's why I often say that climate change is not an issue to add to the list of other things to worry about. It's a civilizational wake-up call, a powerful message spoken in the language of fires, floods, storms, and droughts, telling us that no matter how much we flatter ourselves, we were never the boss, we were never a part. Humans are neither a plague on the earth nor a god species. We are neither a cancer nor are we a cure. We are just a piece of this magnificent whole. The earth doesn't belong to us, but we belong to the earth. And that is not a demotion, it is a gift. It is worth fighting like hell for, for the rest of our lives. And as Bell Hook says, beyond that too. So let's not fight for nature, let's be nature, defending herself. Thank you. Yeah.